sitting the whole time. He'll be up and around and following me around. This class size is going to be pretty manageable, which will be nice. Uh, this course is designed to be an eight-hour course because you have gone through it with Miss Laverne and, and kind of seen the ins and outs of it. We won't have to do that, so we'll we'll knock through it pretty quick because you guys know all the lingo and all the nomenclature things like that. It'll go real fast. Uh, first, to introduce myself. My name is Robert Strady. I am a biologist with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. I talk funny. I understand that. I'm from Wisconsin. I will say you guys instead of y'all. I will also elongate my A's and it'll sound funny when I say no. Not sure why, but it does. Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs>
Also in your packet, you're going to find uh, one or I believe there may be two DVDs. One is a basic archery instructor refresher course. Keep this with you. Even if you lose your book, if you keep that CD, it's got all the information that's in that book on that CD. Before you start teaching it, say it's been a semester or a year or a couple of years, watch that DVD, it'll help you out. Another DVD in there is Beyond Mask, and that uh, gives a little bit more information beyond the scope of the program. Anybody who decides they enjoy it and want to take it a little bit further, that's something for you to help you. The last thing in there is what we call our string bow. This length of string will come in very handy for you and it will be vital to teach new students this program. This comes long before those do. And this can be used anywhere. Kids can keep it in their pocket, practice on the bus. I had many teachers tell me this is a, a bit of a distraction in other classes. When they leave the PE class and they go into math class and they're all sitting there using their string bows, but it's a great tool for archery. Everybody has all of those things. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move in. Um, archery, as a, as a sport, has been around a long time. We all know the, the origins of our nation here. Native Americans have been using stick and string for long before uh, we came about and archery equipment has only grown and, and branched out into a lot of different forms. Archery is a life sport. You know I played basketball and baseball and football when I was in middle school and high school but I'm not going to go out and play a pickup game of 11 on 11 tackle football with full pads tomorrow. I started doing archery when I was probably 10 or 11. I'll do it until my shoulder gives out. This is something that you can pick up at any age, just about any age, and you can carry it on until, like I say, you can't pull a bow back anymore. As long as you can pull that bow back, physically you can be successful at archery. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at our range. Range setup in NASP is very standardized. As I've said, everything in NASP is very standardized. It's that way for a reason. It's taught in public, private, parochial schools. In order to do that, it has to meet a lot of standards. It's designed to be shot inside a gymnasium. In order to do that with, with archery equipment, it had to be very standardized and very safe. There has never been a safety incident in the National Archery and the School of Never. And nobody wants to be the first one. Ten years, 9.8 million kids, and never a safety incident. Archery is rated safer than all the ball sports, except for ping pong. <laughs> I don't know, I've seen some of those ping pong matches that get pretty aggressive, so it might be on the verge. As you can see, what I have here is a, a typical range setup. This is what is considered one kit of equipment for the NAS program. It contains a curtain, which this is a curtain that was provided here. The curtains that you purchase for the NAS program are not as tall, they're 10 foot tall, they're 30 foot wide. This one was already in place, which is great. Not many schools have an archery. In fact, no high school, elementary, or middle school that I've been to ever had. This needs to be suspended away from the wall must be at least 30 inches, which is one arrow length. Mask arrows, these are Eastern 1820 aluminum arrows. This is the only arrow that will ever be shot during a NAS program. There will never be carbon arrows, because carbon arrow splinter could pose a safety hazard. They will always have the aluminum shafts, it will always have the same three inch plastic bands on. There are two different styles of push on knock and push in knock. We'll deal with those later. But you can use this arrow to set up much of your archery range. Okay, have you guys do this all stand up and you're going to follow me. We all sit down and we'll eventually fall asleep. And I'm not much for talking to sleeping people. So. 
I'm going to have you guys do is just follow me around and we're going to walk through the range. This is going to be your typical setup. It is on page 9 in your large course book and I'm not sure in your pocket guide there should also be a diagram in there. It's pretty small, but it, it does give you the numbers if you've got good eyes. We're going to start down here on the end. Go ahead and follow me. As I said, this arrow curtain needs to be 30 inches or one arrow length from any solid structure. So behind this arrow curtain, there should not be anything for 30 inches, nothing solid. The reason for that is this arrow curtain is designed to absorb the energy of this arrow. If this arrow hits it, it's not going to just stop dead. We want that curtain to be able to absorb it, and we don't want anything hard behind it because it'll bounce back. That's what we're trying to avoid there. The arrow curtains that you use in the program are arrow resistant. They are not arrow proof. Although with these NAS bows that only go up to 20 pounds, you can probably stand right here and shoot directly at it. It will probably stop it. If someone brings in a high-powered uh, compound bow, a hunting bow, the arrow curtains that we use will not stop it. That's not what it's designed for. This equipment is designed for this program. The next dimension that you're going to need to remember is your target bus needs to be no more than one arrow length from your curtain. So when you touch the curtain with an arrow, it should hit somewhere on your target. Reason for this, as I said, the standard NAS curtain is 10 feet high. If I put the target's way out here, there's a chance that if that hits at the exact right angle, it could deflect over top of that curve. Once again, that's designed for safety. These targets have an 80 centimeter feet of target face on. It's the only target face that will ever be used for NAS competition. In school, you can do a lot of fun things. You can get balloons and put them on there. You can take a blank piece of paper, do tic-tac-toe. Um, you can even get what we're trying to produce now is a, a burlap cover that has images of deer and turkeys and squirrels and rabbits and shows where the correct shot placement, you can put those over top. But for tournament, it will always be an 80 centimeter feet of target with 10 scoring rings. The way these targets are scored is from 10 to 1. The first inside circle and the next one are 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. That's how the scoring goes for the tournaments. When you first are teaching this to a, a class of students, their first introduction, you don't care about score. Your goal is to get them to hit the face of this target. And that's why we encourage you, the first time that you teach this program, cover these faces. Get a piece of paper. Um, some of them have... There's several different targets you can buy. Some of them only have a target on one side. You can spin them around. But the goal is not, this program isn't designed to develop professional archers. Much as the JOAD program, uh, Junior Olympic Athletic Development, their goal is to develop Olympic archers. The NAS program's goal is to give as many kids an opportunity to learn something new and excel at it. So that, that's the difference between the programs. Next thing we want to look at is the distance between the targets. These targets from bullseye to bullseye will be two arrow lengths, or 60 inches. So once again, you, should, you can still use this arrow. Set a standard kit, these five targets, you see here. Next thing we'll look at is this first line on your floor. This is what we call the target line. This target line needs to be two meters or yards from your target face. The purpose of the target line is, once again, safety. When students are removing arrows from the target, they need to be not with their back turned. They need to be turned sideways because you'll have two archers per target. One will be waiting behind the target line while the other pulls arrows. As they pull the arrows, you need to make sure that nobody can catch a, a knock in the stomach or something like that. So they need to be here, looking back that way. It's again designed with safety in mind. 
When you start teaching your students, you want to start them close. You want them, as I said, the goal is to succeed, build confidence. It's not to become professional archers who sees who scores the highest. So when you start your archers, you can start them at five to seven meters is usually a, a good distance. Five meters is likely for lower grades and, and seven meters um, as they progress. 10 meters and 15 meters is what they will shoot competitions at. I didn't mention this program is fourth grade through 12th grade. That's who can compete. I do have teachers that uh, do this program with their third graders. Below third grade, it's pretty tough. The kids are pretty small. Third grade, some of them can, some of them can't. That's why they went to fourth grade. Pretty much everybody in fourth grade can pull back one of these bows. But if you have a class, a group of third graders, and you get a bunch of farm kids that are, are good to go, and they want to do it, you're more than welcome to do it. As I said, five to seven yards back, we're going to move back. This is going to be our shooting line. You'll notice that I'm kind of using yards and meters interchangeably right now. A yard and a meter is not the same thing, but for these lines, it's okay to, to use yards, pace it off, as long as you have the distance necessary so they can safely pull the arrows, and as long as where you're starting really doesn't matter. The only two that are very specific are 10 meters and 15 meters, and that's because they're a competition shooting. This is your shooting line here, where we have these ground quivers placed. You always use ground quivers. The reason for ground quivers is it stops arrows from moving back and being mixed in with the bows. Kids, the arrows are here, the bows are there, the kids are, are back further. You'll notice I have 10 ground quivers here. As I said, two students will shoot per target. The quivers will be spaced one arrow length apart. So for every five targets, you can shoot ten archers at a time. These quivers can, are made of PVC, homemade, quite inexpensive. They don't come as a kit. Uh, some people have started making them and selling them, but it's a three-inch piece of PVC with a toilet flange. Mm -hmm. And it, it works very well for, for arrow quivers. There's two different types of toilet flanges. Not all are the same, <laughs> even though you might think. Some have a knockout in them so that it is solid here. They're an extra 40 or 50 cents at Home Depot. Some of them do not. If they do not have the knockout in them, when I drop this arrow, it will hit the gym floor. This equipment is designed not to hurt gym floors. However, you will find, especially if you're in a high school, that gym floors are very important things <laughs> and are very expensive people are very particular of. So the extra 50 cents, five dollars for ten of them, it's a good idea because then you can say, look, the arrows don't even touch the ground. <laughs> That's something that was, was learned after a little bit of time because a, a basketball coach would come in and get on his hands and knees and look for indentations <laughs> and finish up his floors. Next we're going to move back and here you're going to see a bow rack. This is also Homemade. The reason you'll see some of this stuff is homemade is to cut costs for schools. We all know the budgetary constraints that schools are in, that all of us are in. So any way we can cut costs for schools to get this program in, we do it. This is design of an inch and a half schedule 40 PVC. Uh, four elbows, two T's, and two caps. And some hooks that buy six for a dollar at, at uh, Home Depot. It's about $20 total with glue in that bow rack. It works. It might not be the prettiest thing in the world, but it works. That will always be your bows on your bow rack. Bows always need to be on a bow rack. They don't need to be laid on the ground or held by the archers. It will be between your shooting line and this line that most of you are standing behind is your waiting line. This is where archers will stand when they're ready to shoot and where they'll stand after they shot before they go get um, their arrows out of the targets. And it will be wherever your shooting line, as I said, it can move. Your shooting line is the only one that, that moves independently from 5 yards to 10, 15. Your waiting line will always be 4 meters behind your shooting line. 
So if my shooting line is at 10, my waiting line is going to be at 14. As your shooting line moves, so will your weight. That's the basic range setup. Uh, when you're setting up the range, there's a few things you want to avoid. You want does can we have windows and doors downrange? You can. You can have windows and doors downrange for NAS style archery. If you can avoid it, that's good. If you can't, it's okay. That curtain will stop these NAS bearers. And if not stop them, it will slow them down enough that they're not going to do damage. On doors, any door that is beyond your shooting line, downrange, needs to be both signed and locked. Any door in the same room as your range needs to at least be signed. Anything beyond the shooting line, signed and locked. Anything behind the shooting line needs to be signed. You want to make sure that people know what's going on. You don't want somebody to come in and be surprised. You also want to be aware some gyms have big scoreboards, maybe jumbotrons, something to that effect, depending on how much money they've got. You do want to be aware of this stuff. You don't want something to happen on your watch and you get in trouble with an administrator or a school board because you've now got an arrow stuck in the home portion of your scoreboard. Or the air conditioner in the ceiling that happened. This is all, all designed for that stuff not to happen, and if, if it's taught correctly and the way we lay out today, you won't have any of those problems, but those are just things to keep in mind. Does anybody have any questions on the range or the range setup? All right. I want to give a little safety introduction. As I said, safety is paramount in this program. The first thing that you're going to teach your students, what we just went through, what I did with my introduction and talking about the archery program, things like that, and, and range setup, is not going to be important to your students. You don't need to bring them in and walk them through how everything is set up, what the distances are. That's not going to make a big difference in, in their lives. A lot of teachers I have, they have their kids come out and help them set up. And in doing so, the kids learn about that stuff. This is also a great program for cross-curriculum. Kids come out, they learn distances, they learn conversion from feet to yards to meters, um, arrow length, distances between lines. You can use it in that way. But when you come in, your first class come in, I would advise having everything set up so you can pick up and go. So from this point forward is, is what you would be administering to your students. I'm going to have everybody step back behind the waiting line for me. You can all turn and face me. Okay. As I've said many times, and I will say it until I get sick of hearing myself say it, safety is paramount whole program is based around safety. Two safety rules that you want to stress to your students. First safety rule is going to be the dry fire rule. The only time that we draw a bow is when there is an arrow on the string and it is pointed safely downrange. Dry fire is when you release a bow with no arrow now. This can be dangerous to yourself, as well as the people around you, as well as the equipment. So that you want to explain the dry fire rule. Only time we release a bow is with an arrow knot pointed safely down range. Second safety rule you want to give them is the emergency whistle. You will just say, students, if I blow my whistle five times or more and it will sound like this, that means there's an emergency on the range, at which point, if you hear that whistle, I need you to let down, replace your arrow in the quiver, re-rack your bow, and step behind the waiting line. If an archer is at full draw, about to shoot, and the emergency whistle goes off, you do not want them to think it's okay, well, I'll just be careful and let it go. At that point, they need to let down slowly, Please replace that arrow to the quiver. All students, re-rack their bows and come back here. Once they're back here, you can assess the situation. Once ready to go back, 
we'll start through your whistle commands and we'll go back to shoot. Those two things are going to be of utmost importance for your students. The next thing we're going to do is eye dominance. I watched some of the videos, that, the video that Ms. Laverne sent me, so I know you've all went through it, but I'm going to run through this whole thing as you're going to run through with your students. So, why is eye dominance important to us? Anybody? Because you want to aim successfully if you're eye dominance. If you don't know what you're doing, then you can go anywhere. It's going to be questions. You, you want to draw a bow to the side of your face that your eye dominant. So I'm right eye dominant. I want to draw that string to the right side of my face. The reason for that is you want to keep both eyes open when you're shooting archery. What benefits does having both eyes open have for us in archery? Peripheral vision is one. Balance is another. And the last is depth perception. Binocular vision versus binocular vision, you lose depth perception. So those are three things that are, are crucial to being successful in archery. Especially when you're changing distances, you get farther and farther distance. You can see how important depth perception could be. So we want everybody to try and shoot with their dominant eye. In order to determine your student's dominant eye, there's several different methods. The one that works easiest for me is to have each student, and if you guys can, just spread out on this line for me evenly so I can see all of you. What I'm going to have you do is, is take your hands, put them together. You're going to make about a golf ball size aperture with your palms facing me. And I want you to look at me, which I would be the teacher in this situation, as I walk by you. Your left eye dominant, right eye dominant, right eye, left eye, right, left, right. Right. This going to show. Right. Right. Look at my face. Put it right on my nose. Right. Right. Right and right. Was anyone that I said they were left eye dominant is right hand? Three. <laughs> One in three people that shoots archery equipment right now is not using their dominant eye. We have people that you're right handed, they think they should shoot a right handed bow. You can. You can be a very successful archer shooting with your non-dominant eye. However, you're probably going to close your other eye or else you're going to lean. It's much more beneficial to shoot with your dominant eye. And the thing is, as teachers of students, a lot of these kids you're going to be able to catch before they develop the habit of drawing to their non-dominant eye. For some of you, uh, of you three, do any of you shoot archer? If you've always shot right-handed, mm -hmm. your left eye on, we're probably not going to switch you over. <laughs> it, it's tough. And you guys can still be successful. There's nothing saying, well, might as well just kick them out of class now. They can still be successful. But you're going to be catching these students yeah. when a lot of them haven't determined, don't know any different. If you put them a right-handed bow or a left-handed bow, they just know they have to pull it with the opposite hand that they have on it. So if you can catch them then, it's better for them. It's going to be more beneficial for them. They are more likely to see, succeed if they draw to their dominant eye. I have yet to teach a class, and I've had classes as small as four teachers, where one teacher has not said, I didn't know I was left eye dominant and right, right hand. Like I said, one in three people, when you think about that, is not drawing to their dominant eye. Bad habits are the hardest things to break in archery. You'll have students that shot with their dad in the backyard or shot with their brother and have picked up some bad habit. If, you, if I have a student that's never picked up a bow, it's much easier to teach them the correct way to do it and show them all the steps, and they're going to do it that way every time. And you'll notice that as you get out there and, and start administering the program. 
Next thing that we're going to move to is our string bows. If you don't have it in your pocket, go ahead and grab it and bring it back up. The little book? Yeah. The string. So did he do a better job of teaching that? Did you do? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And you're going to steal, now steal all of his cues, right? Yeah. And that's what we did. We steal everybody's best stuff. Makes us good teachers. This piece of string is vital to this program. This piece of string is vital to the success of you as a archery instructor and to your students for them to be successful. It is just that, a piece of string. <laughs> Ours are a little fancier. They have a nice little heat shrink piece of rubber tubing on there. For your students, these are $5 a piece if you order them from Mass. You're not, if you have 200, 900 students, you're not going to go pay $500. Your school is not going to give you the budget to go pay $5 for a piece of string. What can you use? Any piece of string that does not stretch is not elastic. Parachute cord is what most of the teachers use. You can buy it in very large rolls, rather inexpensively, rather easily. You can get it from Army surplus stores or a lot of even Walmart or Home Depot will carry it. What you do then is you cut it into sections. These that we have are 90 inches. That will fit up to my height, a little bit higher. Um, it's kind of right at the end for me. It'll probably be right at the end for you as well, if not more. But for students, you can even go a little shorter. If you have all fourth graders, you'll find out that you don't need 90 inches. You might only need 80 inches or 75. Whatever works and however many you can get out of that chunk of string, whatever works for you, that's great. This string bow is what is gonna you're gonna teach your kids the 11 steps to archery successful with. What we're gonna do, the first thing, I'm gonna have you take the two tag ends, match them up, fold your string in half, basically. Now I have two ends matched up, everybody's there. Next thing I'm going to have you do is you're going to grab the other end of the string. You're going to release the two tag ends. You have your open palm. Now whatever eye I said that you were dominant, this is, this is where this comes in. So if you're Right eye dominant, you're going to want to grasp the string with your left hand. Your left eye dominant, right hand. If you're too far gone, do whatever, <laughs> do whatever it feels best. So you're going to wrap your hand around, and the string is going to come out the top where your thumb, the rest of your fist meet. Everyone there? Next thing you're going to do is you're going to take your three fingers, these three fingers, index finger, middle finger, and ring finger, and you're going to insert them onto the piece of rubber tubing. This is what we call the archer's groove. It is the first line, first joint of your index finger, straight across to those other two fingers. That is called the archer's groove. Students will always use three fingers to draw the bow. Those three fingers on the archer's groove place on your tubing. I have you bring both hands up perpendicular to the floor. I have you draw back until the tip of your index finger touches the corner of your mouth. Go ahead and don't be afraid. Let your index finger, you want to feel the corner of your mouth. Okay. Once everybody's there, have you released the string from your draw hand? Let it fall. Where that string is entering your hand, pinch it with your loose hand. Release it out of your fist. Now, where you have this pinch, you're going to tie a double overhand knot, which means you're just going to take both strings. Time like you, the first knot of tying the shoe. Hey, 
Take it where you've got it. Make a loop around your index finger. Slip it through. So where you have it pinched. You're going to pull that tight. Anyone having problems with that? Oh, somebody just came and left. I didn't see him soon enough. Oh, well. I should have got here on time. I take my finger out. Okay. Everybody's there? Okay, now we're going to check if, our, if we tied our swing bow to the correct length. So once again, you take your open palm. There's a lifeline on your hand, which is left or right, whichever it is. That is where your bow is going to sit when you're drawing the bow. That's where your uh, string bow should also be. Once again, place that string in your hand. Come out at your thumb, forefinger. You're going to draw back with your archer's groove. Back to the corner of your mouth. You should feel that knot catching there. Okay, at this point, you're going to want all your students to remain at what is full draw. And you're going to walk down the line and see if their draw length is too long, too short, or just right. You can see this poster right here. This explains to your draw length. If your draw length is too long, you will notice that the elbow is either in a straight line with the string, or it will sometimes even be behind an individual's head. It will kind of disappear. That's too long. If it is too short, you will notice the individual's elbow sticking out into space. It's too long. When it is the correct length, if I am looking at you and you are at full draw, when I look down that string, and make a line to continue, it should hit the inside of your elbow. So I'll have everyone come to full draw with their string bow. Yours is too short. Yours is very good. Good. A little long. Good. Long. A little short. Good. Short. 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 Good. Short, short. Okay, if I told you yours was short, this knot is movable. Put a little slack through and slide it further down the string. If I told you yours was long, shorten it up. And you can, if you want to see what I'm seeing, have your, your neighbor there on. You can take a look at theirs. You can look at theirs and see what you think. And I'll keep coming around and checking everybody's. Come right to the corner of your mouth. Is this still too short? Feel how your your elbow is out here. You want it to be back here. Still too short. Yours should be probably down here somewhere. That's getting as tall as you are. Right to the corner of your mouth. A little short still. Yours is too long. Look at how much we've learned in the last few minutes. This right here. Spend as much time with your students as you need to. Make sure that their string bow is as close to perfect as possible. Because this is going to determine how they shoot. This is the biggest thing to me that can cause an archer fail or to succeed because these are infinite length draw length bows. They can draw to whatever length they want. They need to develop a muscle memory as to how far to draw that bow back. So I'll walk down the line again. Yeah, you were doing it over there too. Pretty good. <laughs> good. You're a little long still. So good. You don't want your elbow pointing out. Long. Like pointing back. Good. Good. Right, you're straight line. A little yeah. short. Good. Turn your body sideways. 
There we go. There we go. Good. You're still short. You're, yep, you're still a little you're, short. You're, you're still it. pointing. It's getting a little bit better. You're, you're you went a little long up here. Yep. It's just a tad. He overdid it, huh? Yeah, you're just. You can see it on somebody else better than you can see it on yourself. Unless you had a mirror, right? Once you get their drawing perfect and they are practicing with that, they will always, they will know if they're not at that point because it'll feel funny. Like I said, if you develop a good habit, when you start a bad habit, it, it feels awkward to you. But if you start a bad habit, then when you try and change your good habit, it's hard because it, it feels awkward to you. Come right to the corner of your mouth for me. Good. Drop your elbow a little bit for me. Still a little bit longer. You no, know, though, you're grabbing your string. Slide your thumb through there. Slide your thumb through that hole. Right here. This hand. The other thing. Yeah. You got it backwards. There you go. Now bring it up. You're still a little longer. Sharpen it up just a little bit. Said you may feel like you're spending a lot of time on this, and it may not seem important right now, being that's a piece of string, but this will be the most important part for you and for your students. <laughs> Archery is one of those things you gotta do exactly the same every time, you know. See if yeah, you're good. If you if you notice a student is keeping it away from their mouth or their back too far, you can't tell if their draw length is correct because as they pull back they adjust the, the length of their shoulder or the length of their elbow on their face. So make sure the reason for touching, I understand some people don't like touching in their face. It's kind of a weird feeling. The reason for that is every time you draw, you will feel you touch the, the spot on, on your mouth. If you are a hunter, when I, I bow hunt, I use a trigger release. That trigger hits me right here on the cheek, and the reason I know is because I haven't shot in probably a month. I can still feel the bruise where I hit myself every time. And it will always be there because that's what you want. You want to know that you're at the same spot. Because then you know that it's not you that's making the error here. It's somewhere else near 11 steps. So. Is everybody good? One more time. There we go. Okay, now we're going to start. <laughs> got to try to memorize those 11 steps. We're going to start. Well, we've got one more thing. This is kind of an optional. Uh, a lot of teachers like it because it gives the kids something to do. Um, when they're, they're not playing with this, they're not hanging it around their neck. Um, at your knot, go ahead and make a fist. Hold the string in your, your dominant hand. Wrap that, that fist around just above your knot. Where those tag ends come out, go ahead and tie another knot somewhere towards the end of your string, about a half inch to three quarters of an inch above that where it comes out of your hand. This is your string bow sling. You're shooting archery, you don't want to grip a bow very tight. I've had all my life, I've had a problem. Started with golf, and then when I got my uh, driver's license, it was with the steering wheel and archery early on. Finally, somebody corrected me. I grip everything like I'm about to lose it. <laughs> Golf clubs, steering wheels, everything until if I go on a road trip and I let go of the steering wheel, my knuckles are everything white. There's no blood like that. It's not good. It's not good to hold on to something so tight. And that's that's one thing that we teach not only with archery, but that's kind of something with life. You don't want to hold on to everything so tight and be scared to let things go sometimes. So this is, is gonna be your archery, your bow sling. It take your hand, your forefingers, and just slide it in to that hole you just made, 
It shouldn't fit on there comfortably. It shouldn't get too tight. Now you're going to slip your thumb behind the, the next knot. Oh, yeah. Cool. No, it's all right. It's all right if it's a little loose. Mine's very tight because I run out of string. You may not even be able to get a knot. Just slide your, your four fingers in there, and then slide your thumb up behind that, that other knot. So you both, string both, and just kind of hang out here with your hand. Problems again? Now what we'll do, is you'll have that String bow in your hand with string coming up above your thumb. You'll bring it up. You'll come to your full draw. And what you should feel is you should feel that string pulling on your lifeline there. If you tug a little bit on that string, where it's tugging, if you look down, it should be on your lifeline. Everybody good? Any questions so far on the string bow, teaching it, or on the one that they have in their hand? This is where you want to prevent, like, the girls who are turning in, or we Well, usually wait uh, until they actually get a bow in your hand, because uh, it's hard to tell at this point if they're going to... Once you get a bow, it's a completely different animal. So some, there are, what you'll see the most, that she, the question she had asked if you didn't hear it, was you will have shooters that will hit their forearm with the bow string. There is a way to resolve that by turning their elbow out. We'll cover it a little bit later. Do we want to go into that right now? At this point, you won't worry about that. We're worried about the string bow and getting their draw length. We can address that at a later point. You will see it, especially for some reason, young girls are extremely double jointed or something. They are the ones that hit their arm the most. You will see that their elbow, it almost doesn't look natural when you get looking to it. But um, <laughs> they will hit their arm and it will hurt, but it's okay. You don't want them to hit their arm, especially if they're young, because it will discourage them. Something hurts. Logic tells you don't do it again. So we don't want them to, but we will address it later. What we're going to do now, this is when you are teaching the 11 steps of archery. You have your string bow, and this is what you use to teach it. So you will do as I have done. I have all my students on the waiting line. I am now going to have you straddle the waiting line as if you were going to get ready to shoot, as if you're on the shooting line. You're all going to shoot right-handed, okay? That makes it easy for me. You can stand over here. What you're going to go through now is the 11 steps to archery. And the first thing, as I said, is our stance. We're straddling the shooting line. You want your feet about shoulder width apart. Your front foot, the foot closest to the targets, you will draw back a half a step. And you will open it to 10 o'clock. He's that trying to picture it. Number one, stand. Pretend <laughs> <laughs> you're standing on the clock. Oh, if this is straight, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but not you're standing on the clock. Drew, I'm not you, it's right. Ah, Drew's a tip poor Drew. Let's not put it. Step number two is a little bit abstract because they don't have arrows, they don't have quiver in front of them. But step number two is knock. Knock is a. Uh, all of you are a little more familiar with it. People that aren't familiar with archery don't know what knock means. Knock is the part of the arrow that connects to the string. So the second step is to knock an arrow. Students will reach down, grab the arrow below the fletchings. They will come up and over top of their bow, which is always held vertical when on the shooting line. And they will knock the arrow until they hear it click on the string. So step one, stance, shoulder width apart, half step back, 10 o'clock. Number two, knock an arrow, they'll reach down, grab an arrow below the flashings, over the top of the vertically held bow. Now 
back onto the string and place on the arrow wrist. Step three is our draw hand set. Draw hand is the one you're pulling the string back with. Everybody here is going to be your right hand. Remember, three fingers, your archer's groove, will be placed onto the string of the bow. In our case, it will be on the heat string too. Number four, bow hand set. The hand you're gripping the bow with. Grab the bow grip, make sure that the bow grip sits on your lifeline. Not grasping it too tight, your fingers lightly touching the back of the riser. Number five is pre-draw. Pre-draw is when you're going to bring the bow up perpendicular to the floor. Number six, draw the bow string back to the corner of your mouth. Number seven is our anchor. Index finger touching the corner of your mouth. Number eight is aim. This is when you're going to aim through the string down the shaft of the arrow to the target. Shot setup, number nine, also a little bit abstract, but this is preparing yourself for the shot. Keep your muscles active. You don't want to try and stop your body. Your body has a normal static movement in archery. You don't want to try and stop that. You don't want to quit breathing. You want to keep your muscles active. You want to get your back muscles behind you. That's what shot setup's about, preparing for the shot. Number nine is release, and to release, you're going to relax the back of your hand, let the string fall away. After number 10, release, is follow through and reflect. Follow through. You're going to paint your face and touch your shoulder. And reflect is just kind of reflect. Everybody kind of has fun with it. You know, it's, it's a little bit abstract as well, but Reflect is, you're trying to get kids with the follow through to reflect, to not worry about where the arrow hit, but to worry about the structure and the form. We'll run through these all together. Number one, stance. Number two, knock. Number three, draw hand set. Four, bow hand set. Five, pre-draw. Six, draw. Seven, anchor. Eight, aim. Nine, shot setup. Ten, release. Follow through and reflect. Those are your 11 steps to archery. As you're going through with your students these 11 steps, you can always go back to these. Kids can take their string home with them and practice at home. They can practice on the bus, I've been told. They can practice in other classes, although the other teachers will be like, what did you give my kids? But they can do this anywhere. They don't need an archery range. They don't need a bow at home. They don't need to have targets or arrows or anything else. And this is the best practice they can have because this is going to develop muscle memory. So if they practice enough with this, once they get to this equipment, it'll feel second nature because they'll already have the important stuff down. If you have a student that is struggling, send them back to this. If they're not hitting the target, Somewhere in this 11 steps is the problem. It's not a problem with that equipment 99% of the time. It's a problem with those 11 steps. All right, we're going to take a short little break because one, my voice is starting to go and the throat's getting dry, and two, some of you might have to use the restroom. So let's take a look. I'm late. I'll just try to Don't give her a potion. All right, the next thing that we're going to touch on is going to be one thing that's, that's for you as instructors, for you as, as archery coaches and teachers, and that's going to be coaching techniques. Um, what this looks at is how do you work with an archer? Obviously, as an archery coach, if I have students shooting on the line and you're the students, I can't be out here instructing you. So there's four different positions at which you're going to want to instruct an archer. 
You need a volunteer to come up for him? We'll stand over here so you can see us. The four coaching positions are face to face, behind the archer's back, behind the archer's elbow, and well behind the archer. Start with face to face. If he's the archer that I'm coaching, I'm going to want to be standing here face to face from this position. What can I look at of those 11 steps? What can I look at and correct him on? Anchor? Stance? Everything. Here you can get a lot of it. The one thing you can get draw line, but you can get bow hand set, draw hand set, stance. You can watch the way he knocks an arrow. His pre draw, his draw, his release, his follow through. Just about everything. You can't see arrow flight and you can't see draw line. Shot setup. What about shot setup? Shot setup is, like I said, it's kind of an abstract thing. I can watch and see, see your body language. So. The next, so that's face to face. The next one is going to be behind the archer's elbow. And that would be this position. What can I see from here? His aim. His aim. Shot setup. Shot setup. Draw length. Draw length is the most important one here because I can look, I can see perfect. There's a perfect line from his bowstring, and it's hitting him right there, right where it should be. Third one is going to be behind the archer's back. What can I see from back here? I can see his stance, see if he's shoulder width apart, see if that uh, foot is turned open. The other one you want to watch for here is the shot setup. You want to watch his back muscles. You want to see that he's, he's staying active, that he's getting ready for that, getting geared up for that shot. And the last one is well behind the archer's elbow, which is going to be back here. What can I see from this far back? Aim, follow through, draw length, and arrow. Or flight. This is one, it's not one of the 11 steps. But if I have a student that's having trouble hitting the target or is being inconsistent, from back here, I can watch and see what's happening to that arrow. And see what's causing it. See if he is releasing and peaking, and that's causing it, or see what's going on. You can, it's a good spot to see. It's more of a fine-tuning thing. So once they're hitting consistently, maybe they'll shoot three really good, and all of a sudden one will be wayward, and you're like, is there something wrong with the arrow? And you step back, and you see that on a certain arrow, they're just not they're trying to see or something. Those are the four coaching positions, thank you. Face to face, behind the archer's elbow, behind the archer's back, and well behind the archer. Next thing we're going to talk about is CPR. This is how we address students uh, that we're working with in archery. CPR stands for complement, positive reinforcement, and review. So can I have another volunteer? Different volunteer. All right. Is it Drake? <laughs> Drake's going to be my volunteer. So I'm up here. I'm, I'm coaching him. Go ahead and stand on the line as if, if you were going to shoot. Okay, I'm watching him. Let's say Drake is anchoring back on his cheek. So how would I want to address that student to, to get them? First thing I want to do is say, look, Drake, you said your stance is perfect. It was very good the way you had your feet shoulder width apart, foot turned open. Positive reinforcement. You're doing really well. I'd just like to see you remember, anchor that in the corner of your mouth. And then review. Review is I'm going to watch him shoot his next arrow, and I'm going to make sure that he took that, that input that we gave him and he used it. Biggest thing with archery is you don't want to be negative. Negativity is the first thing that's going to force a kid to hang up that bow and never pick one up again. Failure for hitting the target and telling them that they're doing something wrong or what they're doing is completely wrong, something like that, is going to be the first thing that they're just going to say, well, I didn't want to do it anyway. In all activities, not just archery. 
this is stupid, I don't want to do this, you know, it, especially when you're in a group setting like this. Peer pressure being what it is, if I come up here and say, Drake, what's your problem? I told you this stuff. How many times do I have to do that? But he's just going to say, forget it. He's not going to try and get better. He's not going to worry about it. Is it? So CPR again, that's going to be compliment. And when we're complimenting, we want to compliment one of the 11 steps specifically. Your stance was perfect that time. Or your anchor was perfect that time. Positive reinforcement. Once again, you're addressing the problem, but you're doing it positive. And then review. Watch them shoot another arrow. And if they've done well, tell them they've done well. If they haven't done what you've asked, go through it again. Thank you, Greg. Now, at some point, you're going to have to deal with a disruptive student. It's going to happen. Guarantee it. How do we deal with disruptive students? A lot of times, I'm teaching this course to teachers that have been in the classroom for 20 and 30 years, and I feel a little out of place <laughs> trying to tell them how to manage their disruptive students, but it is part of the course, and it's, it's much more applicable here than it, it is with them. Well, what they like to use is a four-step process <clears throat> for managing disruptive students. When you have your students up here, you're going to have the waiting line. Before they can shoot, all toes need to be behind the waiting line. So I might be an instructor, and I might have an individual that doesn't want to comply. So what I'll do is I'll repeat the rule first. Say, uh, as soon as we get started, or as soon as everybody's toes are behind the waiting line, we can go ahead and get started. I'll see if that works. Maybe that doesn't work. What I'm going to do now is use almighty peer pressure. So I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, guys, as soon as, everybody's, as soon as everybody gets behind the line, you guys let me know when everybody's behind the line, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, now everybody's looking down the line, <laughs> seeing whose toe is sticking up. And I guarantee you, kids will, they'll put, they'll put her in her place and she'll back up or else she'll face some bad you stuff. Troublemaker you troublemaker. They want to shoot. <laughs> You're the target next time. Well, <laughs> she still doesn't, she's still, I don't she, care what the kids say, she's still toes across the line. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and bring her on my side. What's your name? Laura. Laura? Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Laura on my side now. So I'm going to say, hey, Laura. Can you do something for me? As soon as everybody's toes are be behind the line, just give me a signal that we're ready to go, okay? Okay. So now she's on my team. It all depends on her. So now, you know, you've got that kid that just wanted the attention. That's what they were doing for Guess what? They got the attention, but they got it in a positive way instead of in a bad way. So now they're helping the teacher. They're helping the coach out. They're usually more willing to, to comply. Usually, it doesn't take past the peer pressure. The peer pressure doesn't get to them. Usually, nothing will. But let's say it goes even further. Bring her on my team, and she doesn't want to play on my team. So she's just being disruptive. This is the point where you're going to have to remove shooting. Most instructors tell me it never gets to this point. And if it does, it gets there once. That student has to sit out. Everybody else enjoys archery. And guess what? Next time, they're they're going to be in line. As I said, this is a very structured system, so it's very easy to, to enforce, and the kids know that if everything, if you start something and run it one way, and always run it that way, people will comply. I also operate a gun range as part of my job, and deal with, we're dealing with a really high influx of shooters right now with everything that's coming out, uh, gun control, conceal and carry. And this past month, 30% of my shooters at that range had never been there before. When they come in, I lay down the rules, and I lay them down a certain way. These are adults. Some of them are ex-Army, ex-Marine, ex-Military. Some of them are police officers. They're all the same when they walk onto my range. And I'm going to tell them the rules the way I want them to be followed. And I'm going to make sure that they're done that way every time. I'm not going to one time, oh, it's okay, just go ahead and leave your gun loaded, it'll be fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm dealing with live firearms there, so I'm making sure that everything is done a certain way. Because if you give somebody an inch, especially students, they will take a mile. And then the next time you try and enforce it, they'll say, but last time. 
And but last time is a hard one to recover. Yeah, that's true. If you give them anything, they will remember. Remember things that you never expect them to. So that's why we lay it out this way. All right, we're now getting, and you're getting as an instructor, to the part where the kids are actually getting to the point where we're going to be close to getting them a bow in their hand. You as an instructor are going to come in at this point and say they've done their string bows. You know, I've went through your coaching techniques. So your kids are going to be coming in, let's say this is the next class period. The first class period, you went over an introduction to archery, told them maybe a little bit about the program, told them what you were going to be doing, got them a little excited. Say the second class period, you're in the classroom, you did string bows, something like that. Third class period, you come in, you've got your range set up like this, they're excited, they see the bows, they see the arrows, they're ready to go. From this point is where I'm going to take you, you're bringing them in on that, we'll call it the third day. And this, this is all laid out in your little pocket guide. If you look on page six, it says safety orientation. This is where, you're, where we're picking up right now. It lays out in here everything. It says objectives, learn how to safely use the archery range, set up, students behind waiting line. Page 11, sorry. <laughs> Students behind the waiting line, that's what I've got. Arrows in the instructor's demonstration quiver, that's going to be my demonstration quiver for right now. Targets are blank. In your classes, when you're dealing with kids, you're going to have paper over the targets, newspaper, something like that. Yeah, and, um, that now, it, it even tells you words you can say if you want to use it straight out of here your first time. And there's nothing wrong with holding this. You're going to come in, I'm going to, as the instructor, I'll be in your position where you'll all hopefully be in a year or so. Bring in, and my kids, all right, everybody, go ahead and get behind the waiting line. As soon as everybody's behind the waiting line, we can go ahead and get started. All right, welcome, everybody. Today we're going to start international target-style archery. Archery is fun, and it is safe, and we want to keep it that way, okay? I'm going to explain to you two safety rules that are very important. First safety rule is the emergency whistle. If you hear me blow this whistle five times or more, which will sound like this, that means there is an emergency on the range. I need you to let down, place your arrow back in the quiver, re-rack your bow, and step back behind the waiting line. Once I address the situation, we'll be able to go back to shooting. The other safety rule I want to address is the dry fire rule. Does anybody know what a dry fire is? Wow, uh, drawing a bow without an arrow being knocked and pointing towards the target. Very good. We never want to release a bow without an arrow loaded and pointed safely down the range. This is called a dry fire, to fire a bow without an arrow knocked on the string and pointed safely down the range. We want to avoid dry fire because not only could it injure you, but it could also injure your neighbor and it could damage the equipment. Those are our two base rules. I am now going to show you how to safely use the range. This is the point where you as an instructor are actually going to go through. He's going to ask you to do this. Learn by doing. The kids are going to watch you and you're going to do it exactly right. And that's what they're going to remember. Right, students, I'm going to step behind the waiting line with you. Once everyone's toes are behind the waiting line, you will hear two whistles. It, those two whistles signify, get bows. It will sound like this. At that point, when you hear the two whistles, you will move up to the bow rack. Left-handed bows are on the left side of the rack. Right-handed bows will be on the right hand side of the rack. If you notice, the arrow shelf on a left-handed bow, this area here, where just below the arrow rest, if you hold that up and you hold your left hand up and make an L, if that arrow shelf, shelf makes an L, it is a left-handed bow. If the arrow shelf is the other way, in other words, does not make an L, 
It is a right vehicle. Mm -hmm. You all know which eye dominant you are. Choose the correct bow for your eye dominance. I'm right eye uh, right dominant. I'm going to shoot a right handed bow. At this point, you will move forward with a straddle of the shooting line and you will place bows on toes. And we know bows on toes, don't we? Two whistles, get bows, come to the shooting line, bows on toes. Once everyone has their bow and is standing straddling the shooting line, bows on toes, I will give one whistle blast. One whistle blast means shoot. At that point, you will go through your 11 steps of archery. Stance, shoulder width apart, front foot half step back, open to 10 o'clock. <laughs> Second, knock, pick the arrow up below the quiver, below the flashing, thumb down, up and over the bow. You will knock the arrow directly below the knock locator, which is this little black piece of string, or on some it's a white piece of tubing, directly below your knock locator. Below. With the odd colored fletching. Each of these arrows has three fletchings on it. Two will be one color, one will be a different color. That odd color fletching, also known as the index fletching, will face towards you as an archer, away from the bow's riser. So index fletching towards you. So we've got stance, knock. Number three is our draw hand set. Remember, our archer's groove, three fingers. First joint of your index finger across to the other two. Place that on our string. Number four, bow hand set. The grip of the bow on our lifeline. You're fine. You're fine. Number five, pre draw. We're bringing it up perpendicular to the floor. Number six, draw. Number seven, anchor at the index finger at the corner of our mouth. Number eight, hit aim. Number nine, shot setup. Keeping your back muscles active. Number 10, release. 11, follow through and reflect. Okay, I'm going to go through the steps once again with my second arrow. This time, I'm only going to say the name of the step. I can explain them. Number one, stand. Number two, now. Number three, draw hand set. Number four, bow hand set. Number five, pre-draw. Number six, draw. I'm going to anchor. I'm going to aim. Shot set up. Release. Follow through and reflect. All right. This time, I'm just going to go through it as you will. Uh, I'm just going to, if you drop an arrow, students, if you drop an arrow, whether you drop it in front of the shooting line, behind the shooting line, next to your neighbor, leave it. Please leave it where it is. Do not bend over and pick it up. Raise your hand, and I, as instructor, will get you another arrow to replace, replace that one. Do not pick up the arrow. I will get it after the shooting, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, after I'm done shooting, after you students are done shooting, you will take your bow, you will return it to the bow rack where you got it from, and you will step back behind the waiting room. And that's what you'll do, that's how you'll run them through it. Now they've seen everything, now they're, everybody's back behind the waiting room. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take all your students and show them how to retrieve arrows. So you're back behind the wing line with them. Students, after everyone has shot and all the arrows are at the targets and everyone's behind the waiting line, I will give you a signal of three whistle blasts. Three whistle blasts means go get arrows. It will sound like this. I have you all follow me down to the target. Now, on the way down, as an instructor, you pick up the arrow first. As an instructor. 
instructor, when they were shooting, I would, I would have been between the waiting and shooting lines. Or I would have been ahead of them. So you want to move to any arrows on that line, and you want to be standing by them so when you blow those three whistles, you can pick them up before they come. You don't want them stepping on them, walking over. So if there's multiple, you can start picking them up as you talk. And you want to get them before you get done. The instructor will always be the first one to the targets and will always be the last one to leave the targets. If you pick an archer's arrow up and you pick it up behind the shooting line, you may place it in their quiver. If you pick it up ahead of the shooting line, bring it down to that archer's target, lay it on the ground in front of their target. That way they can collect it. Everybody needs to keep track of their own. All right, students, I've blown my three whistles. We've moved down to the targets. We have two students shooting per target. We do not want anyone to get injured with an arrow. So you will communicate between the two of you. One will stay at this line, which is our target line. The other one will move forward to pull arrows. After they are done pulling their arrows, you can switch. So you work that out between the two of you. Gentlemen, remember, ladies first. Add a little life lesson in there, teachers. One teacher told me, he's like, I'm sure to tell my students that girls go first. He said, there's not enough chivalry anymore. Mm -hmm. When you come to pull your arrows, you will brace the target with your leg. You will pull the targets that are highest and closest to you first and work your way away from them. When pulling arrows, brace the target with your leg. Place your off hand around the shaft of the arrow. Take your pulling hand around the shaft and run it up to the target. Your two hands should now be touching. When you pull the arrow, you should be looking back at the target line at your partner. When you draw this out, you want to make sure that you, they can't get pulled. That's why we look so we can see them. After you've pulled the arrow, set it on the floor, move to your next arrow. After all of your arrows are pulled, gather up your arrows. You will tap them on the top of the target, point down. At this point, you will turn them perpendicular to the floor, cover the points with one hand, hold the shaft below the flushing with the other hand, and carry them perpendicular <coughs> back to your quiver. Upon arriving at your quiver, drop the arrows in, and progress back behind the waiting line. And we can get started with the next round. So right there, you just showed your students exactly what should be done. Ask them, does anybody have any questions? Because once this gets going, as you can tell, everything can run off whistles. You don't really have to say a word, which is a beautiful thing about the program. Run everything off that whistle. They hear those whistles, they know what to do. Everybody, what does one whistle mean? Shoot. Two whistles. Three whistles. So well, as you can tell, one, shoot, two, get bows, three, go get arrows. It's easy to remember. Them. I talked about carrying the arrows. Why do we want to carry them the way in the fashion that we do when we're walking back to our quivers? Remember, this is not basketball. This is not football. If you're a football coach, guess what? Your kid can, one of your players can break his leg at practice the night before. Tomorrow you have a football program. If someone accidentally falls and accidentally falls on the knock of an arrow and makes a bruise on them, you do not have an archery program tomorrow. It's just the nature of the beast. That's why some of this stuff may be like, man, this is repetitive. Man, this is just, it seems silly. It's not silly, it's safe. And like I said, never been in an accident and you surely don't want to be the first one. So we carry arrows in that fashion. Kids trip. Kids trip over painted lines. I do sometimes. If I'm carrying arrows like this and I trip, guess what? The arrows are going out and I'm going to catch myself. So the first thing your body does is use your arms to catch yourself. If I'm carrying arrows in this fashion and I throw them out, and one happens to stick, and the moon phase is just right, and it stands up long enough for me to fall on them, your archery program is gone, and it'll never come back. 
It's the hard thing about programs like this is, like I said, football, break a leg, got a game tomorrow. Archery, it's, it's not that simple. So it's, it's just something that the founder of this program is safe. And it will stay safe as long as you run the program the way it's designed to be run. So now you've told your students how you want things to be done, how you expect things to be done. Not just how you want them, but how you expect them to be done and the way that you will allow them to be done. At this point is when you are going to observe your archer's first shots. This is another very important, important step. I would like to have, we'll just do, we don't have any left hand. I can shoot. I can shoot. I've still got ten. He's sitting in the left. I've got ten bows, so I'm going to take. How many total do we have here? Two or four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Okay, I'll just take seven of you. Just everybody pair off and, and send me up one half of the pair. Well, don't come yet. Just pair off. So A and B. So I'm. And I'll have I'll have the B archers please take one step back. Don't miss. Don't miss. Again, if you've got a pocket, put it in there. If you want to put it back with your stuff. Also, go ahead and take the whistle and tuck it in your shirt. You'll make sure your kids don't have anything hanging down that could get caught. Hooded sweatshirts with the strings on them. Have them tuck the strings in and jewelry, things like that. Usually for gym class. That stuff has to be taken off anyways. But, uh, okay, students, I'm now going to observe your four shots. When I blow two whistles, you will get bows and you will travel to the shooting line. Remember, bows on toes. You will not have any arrows in your quiver. I will bring arrows to you individually and observe your first shots. <laughs> yes, he did. Okay, when you observe your student, student's first shot, you will always start on the left-hand side of the shooting line. Why is this? Not necessarily, because we might have a left-handed archer. They're watching the whole thing. It's not about them. It's about safety. If I start on the left-hand side, I give him arrows. When I step back to my next archer, everybody's ahead of me. If I start here, and I give him arrows, and then I start talking to her, and her I don't know what he's doing with his arrows. I turn my back on a brand new archer. So remember, always start on left. Now, what about left-handed shooters? Where do I put left-handed shooters? It doesn't matter. We don't, that's another thing. One, we don't want somebody to feel different because they're left-handed. <laughs> Maybe in some aspects they are, but it's okay. It's okay to be left-handed. The, the thing is, if we turn around and act as a left-handed archer, he may be left-handed, and he may be right there, but after I give him arrows, after I give him arrows, he's still in front of me. Even though he's left-handed, his back may be to me, but he's still in front of me. I'm not worried that his back is turned to me because he's not watching me. I am watching him. So left-handed, right-handed, doesn't matter where they stay. Thank you. When you watch their first shots, you might want to start with one arrow. You might want to start with three. You might want to start with five. You will go to each individual archer. Right, everybody bows on the toes. The bow will always be on your front toe. The target, the toe closest to the target. Move here. Move the bow to your front toe. You remember a lot from this morning, huh? Does everybody have the correct bow? You should have made him put him on the front toe, didn't you? Yeah, I thought so. I thought Drake did too. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> they actually pay well, you I, get back you guys. <laughs> I get paid to do this. All right, your your first archer. You're gonna go ahead. Give them three arrows. All right, great. Here's your first three arrows. I remember I had not blown that shoe whistle. So you had, don't blow that shoe whistle. You're gonna blow it once. You're not gonna blow it for each archer. Give him his three arrows. All right, students. When I blow one whistle, you mean. Remember, it means to shoot. You will not have arrows until I bring them to you. However, there will be other archers shooting. Okay, you move to this archer and say, Drake, I'm going to watch you. Please go through the 11 steps and say them out loud to me as you shoot this first arrow. Once he's done with arrows, he will re rack his bow and go back down. Right? 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 Now this is a good time when you're doing this. Those B archers that are back there, they can have their string bow practicing. Tell them, hey, follow these guys, follow all the 11 steps so that you're ready when you come up. By the time you get through the first couple archers, they're going to be ready. So that as soon as you give them arrows, you're going to say, okay, just go ahead, tell me the 11 steps. What do you do to well, hopefully, if you have a young dad in the beginning, you will go on the power. I always had to play a small time, and you will go on the power. But now, but you see if you start with a tree, you have a tactics. Okay, we're going to do your first shot. I'm going to say, we're going to start with a tree. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And the thing is, what do I go at? Hey, I'm going to do it. Nobody wants to try it. There is, there is no problem. There is no problem with having these signs. I normally hang them up there on the net so the kids don't have to memorize them. They can read them. You can also stand there and, and help them through. Uh, you can attack this however you feel is best. You don't have to have them say everything, but you do want to watch them. Watch for the 11 steps. See what they're doing. Seeing if there's any improvement. Oh! 
Yeah, that was on. <laughs> You can prove it to your family. I have it on tape. Wow. It's amazing when your elbow's in the right place how much better it is, isn't it? the big boys for last. Well, but this would take the eight-hour workshop instead of four if, if we didn't go over. You got 70%. Of it, you, know? you just got to polish it up. a lot better if they taught Monday. But it wasn't these bows either, with the old bows I had, the little stronger. So I was just telling them, is that happy already? Nope, even then. Yes, that is kind of an issue. That's a good time to go ahead and tell them. Look, you did, your stance was very good, and you had um, several 11 steps down. I want you after this to, after you finish your arrows, to go back with your string bow and work on your 11 steps while this next group shoots. That string bow is a great thing for them to have, have back there. It occupies their time, and it also gets them to, to work on those 11 steps. So now once everybody's shot, they're back behind the line. This is my first time. I'm going to let them go down and get the arrows. So, so I see everybody's closer behind the line. Yes. Yeah, well, when you're shooting, you'll be behind your target lane. So if you can move over there now or we'll walk down. But when they're shooting, they'll be directly behind their target. And after a while, they'll know which target's theirs. They'll know which bow is theirs. They'll have everything to specify. <laughs> I can say you're teaching our training. This line down here, you don't necessarily have to stop after only one heart. If you're the only one, you can tell how many players are. If there's two, I'm the way down to talk about who's going to pull first. And when you get down there, one will come forward and one will stay back. So I'm not blowing any more whistles because. Yeah, 
But once they learn the system, it goes fast. Really? And the program was designed by PG. And that's obvious. It has all the nasty things. You know, the standards benchmark and GLE, they all match up. That lesson plan is so detailed. Well, this is specifically in for in school. As I said, as an instructor, you are the first one down there, the last one to leave. Something that you always want to do before you leave the target line, check behind your curtain. Those curtains that we use are white and they're, they're sheer, you can see through them, but you still want to take a peek behind it. It doesn't, they don't wrap around them. So you'll be able to go around the end, take a look behind it, make sure nobody decided to play a very scary game of hide and seek or something. <laughs> <laughs> I have had Thanks trainings. I have had trainings where there is a door downrange. It was signed. It was locked. A gym teacher had a key, or a basketball coach had a key oh, to no. it. Walked in in the middle of shooting Oof. because they didn't think that sign applied to them. They didn't question why the door was locked. You did everything right, but you also need to realize that you need to have this whistle ready because if somebody comes through a door, you want to get those five whistles out as quick as possible. Now, if you're an archer, if your students are, an ar are up here as archers, and they're going to ask you the question, what happens if I see something that you don't? Do I just keep shooting? If one of your students asks you that, or if you want to go ahead and tell your students, if you see something that's not right, lower your, your bow, put the arrow in the quiver, and let me know. You don't want them to cause a panic and start screaming or anything like that, else like that. Sometimes you'll forget you have a whistle. The words cease fire are also good. Tell the kids, you know, if I forget the whistle or for some reason, you have gum in your mouth and you go to blow the whistle and now it's stuck in the whistle. It doesn't <laughs> Cease fire is another good thing. There's going to be stuff that's going to happen. It's unexpected. It's life. So just realize that you do need to be aware. In my training session, when I go through with each teacher, I will find, I normally do this in, in schools, gyms, and I will go in their supply closets and they're teaching. Uh, other instructors, and I will find one of their kickballs or something, and I will throw it across the range and see if they react to it. The last training I did, one of the teachers I had, she was supervising first shots with the other students that were taking the class. She was right here supervising the shot. It was a gym four times as wide as this. I bounced a yellow dodgeball across the range between the shooters and the targets. She never saw it. Oh my goodness. It, because she was so worried, she was so nervous about right. being watched and being, you know, being a teacher, for a professional teacher to be taught, it's, for a lot of them, it's unnerving because they're used to being the one That's teaching true. kids. So when you they're put the them students. in that spot, a lot of them are still just as anxious as the kids are. She was focused. She was remembering her 11 steps and watching them. That ball, literally bounced all the way across and all the archers stopped and she just kept it. Kept it. <laughs> That's Remember ready. that you need to be aware of everything going on around you. A lot of people ask me, you know, I have B archers back here. Well, some of these classes, some teachers have 60 kids in a gym class. They've only got one set of equipment, only shoot 10 kids at a, at a time. How do I do this? I can't. It's not possible. They've developed a couple different programs where this only takes up this much space. Rest of your kids, they have uh, one setup where some kids do sit-ups, some kids do push-ups, yeah. and it's a, like a circuit train. Right. So while one, it only takes, once this gets going, it only takes about two minutes for them to go from there, to shoot, back there, draw their arrows and back. About two minutes once they're, once they're going good. Um, so you can do a circuit train type thing to keep them preoccupied. We go ahead and we'll bring the archers up as soon as everybody's toes are behind the way. 
next year I can afford to spend more time on archery because I want to play basketball and volleyball and soccer and uh, football. It will be in the team sports class. It gets more fun than you want to on Okay, what I'm going to have us do is all the A archers, you got to shoot the bows first, you didn't see this one coming. Whoever is shooting in your spot, you're going to come up and you're going to watch their first shots. You're going to go over everything just as I was. No, yes. So Get to be a teacher. Up. Wow. First one looks pretty good, didn't it? I want to do my video again. Yes, I bet you do. Tell me some things that you, that, those of you that were the instructor, tell me some things that you saw on the archers. Did anybody else in here see anyone that didn't follow through as far as painting the face and touching the shoulder? Uh, after we realized we didn't do it, it was just in the <laughs> That is going to be the hardest thing. It, it took me a long time to get to where I would do it because it's, it's, it is a bit unnatural. The reason that follow through and you feel kind of like you're pestering the kid, they might be doing everything else perfect. They're not painting the face and touching them. The thing about the paint the face, touch your shoulder is it takes their mind off where the arrow hits. It removes that anxiety, it removes that desire to peek. Peeking in archery is much is similar to a, a golf swing. If you look up before you hit that ball, that ball is not going to go where you intended to most of the time. If you Try and if you pull away to see where that arrow hits before you release it or as you release it, that arrow is not going to end up where you want. So that's the reason why follow through basketball shots, you know, you want to finish the shot. So even though it may seem like, man, they're doing really good, maybe I shouldn't worry about the follow through, try and get them to do some sort of follow through. Not everybody's going to paint their face and touch their shoulder. Some people might touch their ear or some people might move back a little bit and stop and get them to think about something after the shot 
besides the shot. That's the importance of it. You don't want that, and that's the same as the reflect. Reflect, think where that shot go, why did it go there, how do I change it for the next one? Follow through is probably going to be the, the thing that you see the most. If you have a student who, when they draw the bow, the arrow keeps coming off the rest. What's the most likely reason for that? Anybody know? Think backwards. What most commonly happened, if you've ever watched movies or TV shows where they use long bows or something like that, people shoot split finger. They put one finger right. above the knock and one below. Kids see that on TV, kids see it. They have their little toy bows at home that don't have knock locators, so you have to hold the arrow there. If a student grabs the string with split fingers, when they pull back, they put pressure on that arrow, and that causes the arrow to pull out. So that's one thing you'll see a lot with kids. You'll notice it. It's a quick fix. Just tell them. That's why it's the three fingers below the, uh, the arrow. The arrow knot should be pushed up against the knock locator. The fingers should be touching the knock of the arrow. Some kids like to grab it an inch below, you know, or, or even farther. You want that to be a, a continuous string of contact from the knock locator to the knock to their index. Those are just some things to notice. We talked about the elbow hitting your forearm. It is allowed to use forearm guards in NAS archery. You are also allowed to use finger tabs or gloves for NAS archery. <clears throat> you are not allowed any sights. You are not allowed any marks in your sight window. You are not allowed any sort of re release mechanism. These are very standardized. We'll go over the bow in a little bit. But just remember that you can use the arm guards. I'm going to show you now is what we talked about with the arm. If you have a student that's having trouble with hitting their forearm, you can have them put their hand against a door frame or a wall. Door frame works the best because there's a corner there where they can wrap their thumb around. If you notice somebody that's having problems, you can show them, I can turn my wrist and my elbow moves out. I don't know if you can all see that from where you're at. My elbow now becomes vertical rather than like that. You'll see when, when they put their arm against the wall, it'll look like this. It'll almost be uh, perpendicular to the floor. If you show them that they can just turn their wrist outside, it doesn't move where my hand is. My hand stays the same. I'm just pivoting at the wrist. And that'll, that present, uh, <clears throat> gives you clearance from that string when it comes forward. Some students will still have trouble with it. Arm guard is fine, perfectly fine. They're cheap. They can get them at Walmart. You can buy a couple for your class. They're a couple bucks. Walmart Academy, something like that. So. And the second group, go ahead and go down and pull your arrows. Caffeine, you know? Caffeine. Caffeine. So you think you got this stuff? Now you want to go do your video. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you know about the left of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also was in the videos from last year. Last year. Normally, in the, the full course, for those that are just coming in for one day, 
I would have each of you come up and go through those two things. You would come in, you'd give your introduction, you'd explain the safety rules, you would demonstrate how to shoot, pull arrows, and then you would bring the instructors up and you would watch them supervise their first shot. With you guys already having gone through the class, being very familiar with the number of people, we won't have time to do that today, but I do want to ask, is there anything, anything, no matter how silly you may be, any question that you have about anything, the way the range runs, any questions that you can see popping up, kids come up with the craziest questions, so.